cool. Hi, yeah, that's true. I'm Ashley. Uh, I hope people. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to try to speak slowly. I often speak too fast. So let's see how it goes. Part zero, the introduction of this talk. Um, I always like to provide some context as to where I'm coming from when giving a talk, especially at one that's at such an interdisciplinary conference such as this one. So for this talk, I'm going to be speaking um, by way of my experience as a researcher of early 2000s web-based artworks and uh, also as an educator in technical concepts to a non-experienced audience and three in my capacity as a systems archivist at Artifactual Systems. I work primarily on the Archivematica project. So um, I'm not necessarily representing Artifactual in this talk, uh, but it's for context as to the work that I do, uh, where I work with uh, major art museums and large universities and archives that handle miscellaneous video materials. So uh, I guess this is a little bit to say that this isn't my full-time job, but that some of my jobs and hobbies, which maybe add up to a full-time job, uh, have me interacting with weird files and helping others make decisions on what to do with them. Um, and as a brief point of this talk, I realize this talk is, is targeting an audience that is mostly new to working not just with FFmpeg, but on the command line or even in a technical capacity at all. Maybe like if you are a digital archivist, oftentimes you get, uh, suddenly you have to do different work that you didn't know how to do before. So that's sort of the audience that I have here. So and I know that there's FFmpeg developers in the audience, so I've supplemented my talk with cartoons for entertainment for them. Uh, so first of all, what is FFmpeg? Uh, sorry, please watch another talk on that. Um, the one earlier today from Carl is a good example. Um, and that's it. So we made it past part zero, which is the metadata header part of this talk. Uh, so now on to part one, which is understanding video. Um, so what is video? I don't think this question is easy to answer. That's also totally not the scope of this talk either. Um, video means a lot of different things to different people. Uh, it can be an audiovisual format that is not film. It could be a broadcast. It could be a VHS tape. It could be electromagnetic waves that are flowing through the ether, you know, uh, et cetera. Um, but what I'm describing in this talk, it's important to think about video in the same way that FFmpeg thinks about video. So in this context, uh, we should conceptualize a video as being made up of streams. Basically, the streams are in a simple way, video, audio, text, and data. Those are the common ways we work with how video works. Uh, and this image is going to, I tried to make these as big as possible, but um, this image is going to come up a few more times. So FFmpeg follows this pattern as outlined in the official documentation. You can also see it if you type man FFmpeg. Um, so you take one or more media objects, you split each of those into the appropriate streams, you split each of those into the appropriate frames according to the encoding, uh, you put the frames back together in a new way, and then you put the streams back together. It's demuxing, decoding, encoding, and muxing. So demuxing is separating the streams, decoding is separating the bits of a stream, encoding is putting the bits together again, and muxing is putting the streams together again. So you're unwrapping the Christmas package, you're making the Legos, you're arranging them in a different way, and you're putting the package back together. Um, so understanding this concept alone, I think, helps a lot in deciphering FFmpeg logs. And we'll see some examples of that. So we're going to break things down and go through um, just a, an example, an example of what happens when things go well. Uh, so this is the complete uncut console output of what it looks like when things go well, um, which is why it's very small. Um, there's a lot to decipher here. FFmpeg, I think, is a bit chatty compared to other command line tools, and it can be intimidating to see so much text on the screen even when there's nothing wrong. So we'll walk through all of these. Uh, so here's the command that was pasted in. I pulled this from F of Improviser. Um, and as a side note, I think this is a weird, very unnatural command. Um, it was one of the first scripts to be added to FF Improviser, which is sort of a resource slash cookbook for FFmpeg scripts. Um, FF Improviser is, is meant to be a tool for learning, so uh, it's a bit difficult intentionally. 
Um, it's meant to be what Marshall McLuhan uh, considers a cool media uh, to stimulate active thinking, like forcing you to sort of think about something because it's hard to, for you to, to intake. Um, but I inevitably I end up thoughtlessly copy and pasting this in, and I end up with gifts that don't loop forever, and I'm like, what the hell? Uh, so it's not really acting quite as a, as a as stimulating active thinking as, as maybe I want it to. Um, but it's still that's the example that I'm using here. So. Going back up to this long bit of text and breaking it down bit by bit, uh, first FFmpeg introduces itself, hello. Uh, this is the version. This is the version of the C compiler that puts FFmpeg together. Uh, and then it's the configuration. You can see, uh, one, that this was installed with Linux Brew, which I don't actually recommend. I don't know why I did that. Um, and then the large bit uh, that often stats, starts with this like dash dash enable something, you know, dash dash enable version three. That's part of the configuration. So you know what you have and don't have. Uh, and then below that is the versions of each of the libraries. FFmpeg is a library, but it's composed up of other sub-libraries. And those are the versions of each. Um, so then the first thing uh, FFmpeg does after its introduction is it tells you what it knows about your input. Uh, it starts at zero, like computers do. Uh, input zero is the first input. And then it tells you some general information about the wrapper or container, uh, such as what's the encoder that was used, what's the creation time, what's the duration, what's the bit rate. Next, FFmpeg tells you what it knows about your first stream. So again, it starts at zero. Information about the video stream and coding information. It's using the VP8 codec, color space is YUV, it's got a 420 bit depth. Progressive scan, 640 by 480 pixel dimensions, uh, storage aspect radio is 1 1. I think it's story, whatever. The SAR is 1 1. The DAR is 4 3. 30 frames per second. And then something that was new to me um, doing this was uh, the last couple lines, which was the TBN is the container's time base, the TBC is the codex time base, and then the TBR is what the assumed frame rate is. So it's like looking at both of those and what's, what are we going to do? Um, so that's what it's telling you. Um, I think that. This is not crucial to debugging, per se, but understanding these concepts individually are going to help you better understand what's wrong when things do go wrong. Uh, and there may be expectations that you had about your file that was incorrect, and FFmpeg is telling you what it thinks it knows about your file. Um, so then FFmpeg tells you what it knows about the next stream it sees in that one um, video that was input. So this is often the audio stream. It's usually, although in many cases not, there's a video stream and then there's an audio stream. So it's stream 01 because it's the first input file and then it's the second stream. So counting from zero is something that I'm used to as a developer, but it takes a while to get comfortable thinking in that way. Um, an analogy I try to use is thinking about um, how we're in the 21st century, it's 2019. You know, the first century was the hundreds. Um, and still, identify and describing this screen, even though we're making a GIF in this. So in this context, it's going to throw out that, it's going to get thrown out as part of the process because, because we're making a GIF which doesn't have an audio track, but still identifying it and letting you know that it's there and information about it. Um, FFmpeg then, after it's identified these streams and described them to you, it lets you know that, you, that it has a plan for these, that you've given it. Um, so it's mapping the first stream of the first input, 00, zero uh, to the first stream of the first output file, 00, zero VP8 to GIF. Um, FFmpeg then also lets you know that it's not too late. It's about to kick this party off, but you can always escape if you want to. Q to stop, question for help. Uh, then FFmpeg tells you uh, what kind of output file it's going to create. It's making a GIF. FFmpeg tells you the stats of the file it's creating. This is very similar to the slide a few slides back where FFmpeg is describing the input file. It's also describing the output file. These expectations, what you're expecting as well when you're making something using FFmpeg. Um, so here again, it's a reminder of how this works. It follows this pattern of demuxing, decoding, encoding, and then muxing. So this brings us to part two. So we started at zero. This is the third part, understanding logs. So I'm just going to jump through um, some different ways to help you read uh, the FFmpeg output. So part of being a developer is learning how to read logs. Mistakes are sort of constantly happening when you're in this development process. So the first thing to do is to stay calm. Uh, it's normal for things to go wrong when you're testing out a new script. 
uh, testing new parameters for a script, or you're working with unusual files, or files that are full of edge cases, which is pretty much everything. Um, so first advice is read from the bottom up. Uh, the problem is very often the last thing that was printed to the screen. So you start there and you can save yourself from time, some time rather than moving to the top and reading down uh, like a book. You should read from the bottom up. Uh, the next one is, uh, this sounds obvious and it is obvious, is look for the word error. But people who are writing these code libraries are trying to find, uh, trying to follow particular patterns, such as declaring the error by name or using the word warning when something is not ideal, but it's not quite enough to warrant uh, the shutting down of the process. Um, colors work as clues. Uh, FFmpeg is helpful in that it will, when possible, uh, display errors or warnings or informational messages in different colors to get your attention. This is too hard for you to read, but it's somewhat easy to pinpoint exactly where the error might be. It might be a little difficult as well because I use a light text editor and then on a black text editor maybe it's a little more obvious, but there's a red in there. Um, so the next, uh, take a look at what you wrote. Uh, the error is very often in the command. If we use this phrase called like, the problem is between like the, the keyboard and the chair, meaning like you're the problem, um, and not a problem with FFmpeg. Um, but I'll give you an example of what that does look like in a, in a minute. Uh, so take a deeper look at your command. Are you telling FFmpeg everything that it needs to know about this? Um, and also, uh, it's important to use your resources. If the error doesn't make sense to you, paste it into your favorite internet search provider, like DuckDuckGo, uh, because someone has almost definitely had this problem, and you'll probably be guided towards either a Stack Overflow post or the FFmpeg user forum uh, where someone else has already given an answer to this problem. Um, and finally, remember that the error, message are, uh, the error messages are written by humans. Um, and FFmpeg is an open source library, so you can search the source code for that particular phrase. So even if you're brand new at looking at technical things, you've never like read source code before, you may still be able to decipher what's causing the error messages to pop up um, just using basic if-else logic and some elementary math skills, condition, division, greater than or less than. And you can see it usually right above where the error is, is being raised. Um, okay, so let's see what happens when, um, we saw what happens when a simple file conversion goes well. So let's see what looks like when some things go wrong. So part three, understanding errors. So I'm gonna step through some examples of common errors that I've run into, other people have run into, and how they can be deciphered. So we'll start it off with an easy one, maybe I shouldn't call it easy. I think it's easy to read, but it's not necessarily easy to understand. Um, but all the information um, that is wrong with the file is available in this one line. I'm also really surprised at how often this has come up in my career because it's a bit strange, um, but the, the issue is the height is not divisible by two. Um, the dimensions of the original file uh, that in this case this client was working with was 1920 by 1013. Uh, and 1013 is an odd number, um, also like odd in the sense of it being unusual, but also it, it is an odd number. Uh, FFmpeg is then, it's trying to run the libx264 uh, encoder, because you can see that on the top left, and it's trying to encode the video stream of this file into H.264. So H.264, like many other codecs, they break things into chunks for encoding, and the assumption is that all video files would be an even number for width and height, because the way things are chunked up, they're chunked up into eight or 16 or four or whatever. Um, so that's uh, an easy error log to read because the information is in front of you. Um, next, no such filter draw text. This happens if you have compiled a basic version of FFmpeg, so it didn't include the draw text filter. Um, to correct this, you have to reinstall FFmpeg, which can take some time. You use the filter dash dash enable slash libfreetype. Uh, something to note here is that sometimes these things change. So what the default settings are depends on your FFmpeg version, and it depends on the way you are installing things whether it's through homebrew or compiling it on your own, whether you're using the dash dash enable flags or not. 
Uh, and sometimes those names themselves change. So when you're looking for what you need to correct this, uh, it's important to make sure that the information is relatively recent, relatively on board with the FFmpeg version you're working with, especially if it's a major version. It wasn't too long ago where FFmpeg went from a, a 3x to 4x, which usually means there's potentially some breaking changes. Uh, next one, unknown encoder. If you're looking to encode something, you can check ffmpeg codex and you can see a list of all the encoders that exist that you have in your compiled version of ffmpeg. So you may have also just typed the name wrong and you need to double check and you can check that there. I think something common is maybe you want a PCM audio, so you type PCM um, instead of what ffmpeg is expecting, which is PCM underscore S16 uh, LE, little Indian. Um, okay, next. Uh, output file zero does not contain any stream. I wouldn't call that particularly descriptive, but oftentimes when I see this, it's the result of a typo, and I forgot to put dash i before my input file. I work with a lot of other command line tools, and not all of them. Sometimes the input file is, is implicit uh, variable, so you don't have to do a dash i, but ffmpeg you do. Um, OK, and here's a bigger one It's hard to read. Um, it's a bit more complex. So it's, uh, we're working with MP4 here. It, uh, and the description is, could not find tag for codec PCM S16 LE in stream number one. Codec's not currently supported in the container. Could not read header for output zero in correct codec parameters. Invalid in argument. Um, so it's kind of like frantic. It's like, ah, this is terrible. Um, so. Uh, I see this often because um, oftentimes this is trying to make an MP4, which is hinted at by the um, first uh, part of the error message that you see. Um, but it's copying the existing codex that you're working with. So this is, error, like, this is when this usually happens. And it's when you're trying to use the codec that MP4 doesn't like. MP4 is a, a bit particular. And it's happy with codecs like H.264 or AAC, but it's not happy with codecs like FFV1 or PCM. Um, so in this example, it's trying to force the PCM audio into the stream when MP4 really only wants AAC, hence the problem being in stream number one, which as a reminder is the second stream. Um, and that's really the first line of the error, and then the second part is because the error happened during the second encoding, so it's helpful to refer back to this diagram, FFmpegs. Work with the input file, it demuxes it, it sees two streams, it's like, okay, H264, got it, gonna encode this. And then it's like, what's next? Oh, I got another stream. That stream is PCM. Ugh. Like, I don't want this. Uh, and so then it's like, blah. So then this error, the could not write header for output file zero, which we saw a little bit ago in correct codec parameters, is saying that something happened in the codec part of this diagram. Uh, to emphasize that it couldn't put this back together because there was a problem, but it had already done some work. I think it's also when you end up with a file that's empty, which is something when we work with FFmpeg within Archivematica, we check to see if a file's been created, but it's also empty, which means that it probably didn't work the way someone expected it to. Um, next one, I'm hoping Julia Kim talks about this a bit more tomorrow. A move atom not found. Um, sounds important. Uh, the move atom is the index of the file, so it's going to give you important context for things like the time scale, the duration, the display data, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so not having it is pretty bad. Uh, you can see this error occurs for a lot of different kinds of formats, uh, MOV, MP4, M4A, et cetera. Um, and for some formats, the move atom is added to the end of the file. So this is sometimes an indication that the file is corrupted or it's interrupted during a transmission. So it shows that the file was uploaded to a server and that upload link was broken at some point in time, which is what happens, I think, with this file set that I happen to be working with. Um, we'll have lost that piece of the video file. Um, so this next one also requires like a little bit of context clues to figure out uh, where to go and how to dig in. And it's, um, this is an example, too, of it's not always at the end. It kept going, but there's an error like up there at the top. So here it is in bigger, bigger sizes. Um, for this, um, you could see the clue again is the SVQ3, which I had to look up. It's the source in three codec, which rose and fell in popularity in the early 2000s. It was sort of compared to H.264. Obviously, H.264 took off and uh, Sorensen did not. 
Um, and so this one I actually dug into the code for, uh, for this error message of slice after bitstream ends. Uh, and essentially, the stream is getting cut off in the middle. So it's another example of the one that was missing the move atom. Um, I think it was likely from being a disrupted transmission. But it could also be from data loss based on, on being on the server and some sort of data corruption. Um, but it ran out of data to read unexpectedly. So you can see it's like slice bytes times blah, 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 uh, blah, 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 is bigger than that. Like, oh, that sucks. Like, so it's sync. It's, it's, it's expecting more data. It's not receiving it. So slice up to bitstream in. Um, OK, I think we have a little bit of like four minutes. OK, I'll just do these last two that are very quick that I have examples of, and then I will end my talk. <laughs> Um, so uh, with this one, I think what we could tell about this file, giving these errors, is that both the audio and the video tracks are disrupted um, because we're working in so multiple frames in the packet, invalid PCM packets, data size two, these four was expected, invalid data, invalid data. Um, and then this one, again, like FFmpeg is reaching for the next chunk of data that it's expecting to find and work with, and it comes up empty. And EOI in the sentence uh, is standing for end of image, so it has to figure out the rest on its own. So that's why it says emulating, filling in the gaps so they can get to the next image. Um, so that's it. I, there's a couple links on this, which is now posted on the internet. I will tweet out a link and put in the um, collaborative notes. Um, so you can see uh, this FFmpeg wiki page for some errors that happen and what they mean. Um, the documentation, I didn't go into this during this talk, but you can do dash log level if you want more verbose error messages, um, and also FF improviser. Um, so thank you for listening. I'll take any questions. If you tell me a Simpsons joke, I probably won't get it because I don't actually watch The Simpsons. <laughs> Put this back together. Any questions? Out there? All right. Heavy. I'm going to work out with this laptop. One and then. Um, it, you decoded, but have you decoded this uh, long hex number after the name of the codec mostly, uh, after the at sign? At like an email sign, there is a long uh, uh, hex number. Have you decoded what this means? Because it's not explained. Oh, the, so you have like maybe MP4 at something? That's like no, no, uh, it's, let's say the codec, it, you too early drop down the presentation. Uh, so this is the hex that is after the name of the codec or after the something else, a long hex number. Have you decoded what this means? Because I haven't heard. I don't think I understand what, uh, what you're referencing. It's exactly what you said, actually. You understood it correctly. Oh, yeah. It's like the part at point in memory, right, <laughs> in which something is... Yeah, it is, that's why I didn't bring it up. It's not, it's not really of any interest to the, to the user itself. But if you're writing a decoder encoder, I, I find it potentially useful. This is just memory. Well, if you're really into C, maybe it helps with memory management. I think we've got time for one more question. There was a question over here. So. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. My question is, do you think this is um, a quest of an archivist? Because I'm asking, um, for example, in Switzerland, there's a really, um, really small percentage of archivists who can do that. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. if you think this is a job of an archivist, do you think we have to change the studies of archivism? Because also this is really not part of the studies, even if you made um, a MRS or whatever in Switzerland. I do think it's... Um an important part of being an archivist, yeah. And I think, I think that we do need to update our curriculum and how people are, are training. And then Ben Turgis in front of you mentioned he would love to do a 12-week course on <laughs> teaching FFmpeg just because it's such a, I think it's a really great way to understand video and that so much is, is based on digital video that it, it's, really, um, it's really meaningful. Yeah, I don't think it's taught often enough or, or thoroughly enough. <laughs> Wow. This might come up in our panel that I think we'll be rolling into in a moment. Yeah, right now, actually. <laughs> I'm going to welcome Joanna White to the stage to uh, begin the panel, round table, rather.